Good afternoon, colleagues, ladies, and gentlemen. Uh, on behalf of the Faculty of Medicine, Jhulalongkorn University, and MD Anderson uh, Cancer Center of the University of Texas, USA, uh, I would like to welcome you all to the special uh, lecture this afternoon. Uh, we are very proud to have uh, Professor Ethan uh, Dimitrovsky, who is the American Cancer Society professor of the Department of Thoracic, Head and Neck Medical Oncology and Cancer Biology from MD Anderson Cancer Center to be with us today. Uh, Professor Ethan Dimitrovsky is also the provost and the executive vice president of MD Anderson Cancer Center. And today, uh, he will give a talk on uh, the moving prevention mechanism from the bench into the lung cancer clinic. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please join me to welcome Professor Dimitrovsky. Good afternoon. So this is not my first time uh, visiting Thailand. When I was much younger, I actually worked as a doctor here in Thailand, in Aranya Pratet. After the Vietnam War, I worked in the Khao Dong refugee camp. And I just wanted to say how much I admire the Thai people for welcoming international doctors to work in your borders to help your neighbors, the Cambodian people. And so I have a great deal of respect and admiration for the Thai people. Thank you for what you've done. I also uh, know from living for a short while in Aranya Pratet that every home has a picture of the king and the royal family, and I want to express my condolences to your people on the loss of your king. And so thank you all for being here, and I'm going to tell you today a story. So listen along with the story that took me over 20 years to produce. So I'm going to tell you four things today. First, I'm going to tell you quite surprisingly, how basic and clinical research in the field that I study called the retinoids, that I'll tell you about, came together, converged in leukemia, and unbelievably, this has led to a new way to treat and prevent lung cancer. In the United States, the most common cause of cancer death. I'll review the research that we've produced over 20 years that have found that the very proteins that control the division of cells are targets of these drugs that treat and prevent cancer. And then I will describe a 10-year project where we've conducted five clinical trials that validated this target, and ultimately I'll describe future directions. So let me tell you uh, a little bit about the field that I work in. It's called the retinoid field. Retinoids are vitamin derivatives, vitamin A derivatives. Vitamin A is essential for vision for fertility, and it has a wide variety of effects. It can affect the developing embryo, and it also has uh, major beneficial effects in cancer, and that's what I'm going to talk about today. What I'm going to tell you about is an unbelievably intriguing story of a rare but lethal leukemia that can be cured with this drug, all transretinoic acid, and I was involved in that story. And all you need to know about the basic science is that these drugs, these vitamins, work through proteins that are present in the nucleus that are called nuclear receptors. These nuclear receptors come in two varieties. All transretinoic acid receptors that have DNA binding domains and hormone binding domains, and a related family of receptors called the retinoid X receptors which also have DNA binding domains and hormone binding domains. These two drugs have been approved in the United States that activate respectively the retinoic acid receptors, RERs, or the retinoid X receptors. And that's all you need to know about this pathway. I'm now going to tell you about a remarkable discovery that was made first in China and then replicated in the United States uh, by the, the team that I, uh, that I led. And here's work that we published in the New England Journal of Medicine. If you look here, this is a, a leukemic cell. 
And this leukemic cell was from a patient with acute promyelocytic leukemia. And after just two weeks of therapy, you can see how this cell changed in shape. Does everyone see that? Now look very closely. Look at the cytoplasm right here. Do you see these little structures? Those are called our rods, and they only occur in leukemic cells. So what this figure shows you is as you move the patient from the treatment with retinoic acid, you change the cell's appearance. And this was the first successful example of what's called differentiation therapy. Before this discovery, only a small number of patients were cured with this leukemia. And now, essentially, it's a solved clinical problem with about a 95% cure rate. This discovery was first made in China and subsequently brought to France and the United States. And our group led the first American trial that showed that this worked. This was a very exciting discovery. And um, in the course of just a few years, we were able to clone the genetic cause for this disease. And, and Remarkably, it was an abnormal retinoic acid receptor that we called PML or alpha. And here's a picture of this abnormal receptor sitting on DNA. And all you need to know is that when you add the drug retinoic acid, you remove an inhibitory protein that touches this complex and recruit a stimulatory protein. And that's what causes these cells to change. And the patients go into remission. So in the United States, there are just about 2,000 patients a year with this leukemia. And after we were able, we and several other groups, to show that this um, would work and cause remissions in the vast majority of patients, I did an experiment. I asked, uh, by doing a PubMed search, a Medline search, looked in the literature, how many papers were published with the word retinoic acid and the, and the word acute promyelocytic leukemia there were more papers than there were annual cases in the United States. And I thought perhaps it was time for me to work on another problem. So the question we asked was, how could we take this exciting positive result and move it into a more common cancer? And now I'd like to show you one scientific fact. When we treated patients with this leukemia, the cancer-causing protein was destroyed. And we decided to use that discovery to ask whether that discovery could translate into another more common cancer. And we decided to focus on lung cancer. In the United States, lung cancer is the most common cause of cancer death for both men and women. And as you can see in this, it's okay. As you can see, um, over 200,000 people a year in the United States are diagnosed with um, lung cancer. And sadly, all but 17% of them die. Thank you so much. So there's obviously a need for advances. Lung cancer comes in two basic varieties, small cell lung cancer and non-small cell lung cancer. And so non-small cell lung cancer is what we decided to focus our attention on. And this shows you the incidence and mortality of lung cancer in the United States. This is for men and this is for women. <coughs> and as you can uh, see, many more men than women die of lung cancer because smoking is much more common in men than it is in women. But look at this. You see the decline in lung cancer mortality in the United States? And that's due to smoking, cessation, and prevention. But look also for women. Do you see that the lung cancer incidence is rising? And that's because in the United States, starting in the 1960s, women began to smoke. So that's not true in Thailand. Um, women don't smoke in Thailand, fortunately. But that's not true in the United States. And so we decided to ask whether the same drug that we used in retinoic acid treatment of leukemia could be used to treat or prevent lung cancer. 
and we did a very simple experiment that was published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. So uh, the work I just described before was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, the journal Cell, and the journal The Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. We took lung epithelial cells that were benign and added the carcinogen that caused lung cancer, cigarette smoke condensate, or the tobacco carcinogen nitrosamine. And we could take those benign cells and make them malignant. The question we asked is, if we added retinoic acid along with the carcinogen, would the cells remain benign or would they become malignant? And they remained benign. Over the course of about uh, five years, we found out why this occurred. And what we discovered, uh, to our surprise, is that the drug retinoic acid, or its related drug, the rexinoid that I told you about, was causing the degradation of cell cycle proteins, just as it was causing the degradation of um, uh, PML or alpha in leukemia. And so the moment we made this discovery, which we published in the National Acad Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, we thought this is a clinically relevant discovery. And I'll show you one scientific um, observation. I'll tell you this very quickly. This is a, uh, what's called an immunoblot right here. And we have applied uh, a translated protein, the cell cycle protein, and to that cell cycle protein, we've applied cellular extracts from cells previously treated with retinoic acid. And you can see we degrade that protein. We spent about 10 years figuring out the exact mechanism. And now I can tell you that it's through a proteasome-dependent destruction pathway, a natural uh, protein destruction pathway in cells. We found out exactly the, the phosphorylation events that caused this and we discovered the residues that were involved in this process. And at the same time, what we found was that of the three retinoic acid receptors that were discovered, the retinoic acid receptor beta was silenced. And in humans who smoke, in men and women who smoke, the very first thing that happens is you shut off this receptor. So if you give the drug retinoic acid, this can't possibly work. But at the same time, we found that the related nuclear receptor, the RXRs, were still preserved, and they could cause this degradation. So we thought that was clinically relevant. And at the same time, um, we went into great detail to discover the degradation pathway. And over about a decade, we found that this was through the ubiquitin degradation pathway. And several years later, we discovered an alternative destruction pathway. The net result of both of these pathways is that the drug was turning on the destruction of the cell cycle proteins, stopping the cells from dividing and allowing repair of tobacco carcinogen-induced uh, damage to their DNA. Well, that was interesting basic science, but how do you move this discovery from the bench to the bedside. And it turns out, in, in, in um, the clinic, we can identify the precancerous lesions that occur in um, humans who uh, smoke. And these are in, shown in this box here. This is the normal bronchial epithelium that changes to squamous metaplasia, low and high-grade dysplasia, ultimately to an in situ cancer that's a cancer in all ways, but it doesn't invade the basement membrane. Here's an example of an in situ cancer. If you look along with me, do you see this straight, li this line of demarcation between the brown deposited cells and the ones below? Well, that's the basement membrane that uh, separates a pre-malignant lesion from the normal lung behind it. On the basis of this discovery, and only this, we launched clinical trials to ask if we could treat with the rexinoid drug, could we drive down expression of these uh, pre-malignant lesions. 
Over the course of uh, 10 years, we have conducted five clinical trials that were turned out to be quite successful that, that demonstrated that everything that we found in the laboratory was reproduced in the lung cancer clinic. And I'm going to tell you those results. The first trial that we did was called the phase zero study, which asked the question whether the drug, the EGFR tyrosine kinase inhibitor, allotinib, would get to the target and affect the target, in this case, the cell cycle machinery. We then repeated that study with, in, the, in the clinic with a trial with bexarotene orexanoid, got the same results. And then we went on to both phase one, phase zero, and ultimately phase two trials that were published and showed that we could cause a survival advantage in heavily pretreated lung cancer patients who otherwise had no other treatment available to them. Let me show you what these responses look like. This is what we call our phase zero or window of opportunity trials, where we treat patients in the perioperative setting for 10 days. Before surgery, we assess biomarkers, the cell cycle proteins. After 10 days of treatment, we do the same. But now what we do is we measure the levels of the drug, not only in the plasma, but in the patient's tumor. And this is what such a study looks like. This is the pretreatment biopsies, and the, these are the 10 days later, the post-treatment biopsies. And you can see the cyclin D1 falls, the EGFR levels fall, the proliferation marker falls in the post versus the pretreatment biopsies. And this is what was really interesting. Every patient who responded had therapeutic drug levels in their tumors, meaning the same levels that caused this response in the laboratory were needed to cause the response in the clinic. And every patient who didn't respond did not achieve intratumoral levels that were therapeutic. We went on to do the same uh, series of studies with EGF receptor tyrosine kinase inhibitors. And once again, you can see Pre-treatment, post-treatment decline in the proliferation marker KI67, decline of the cell cycle protein expression, and also we saw after only 10 days of treatment, objective anti-tumor responses, necrosis. That was a responding patient. What about a non-responding patient? The difference between these two cases is that this patient had therapeutic intratumoral levels and this patient did not. We then went on to uh, publish the very first phase two study in the world, combining these two drugs together. And here you can see a CT scan of a patient with um, unresectable lung cancer. This is a malignant pleural effusion. This is a lung cancer in the parenchyma of the lung. And now after three months of therapy, you can see the dramatic improvement. So this is a very, very interesting result. Why? because these two medicines are administered in the outpatient setting. They're both oral therapies. So for the lung cancer doctors <coughs> here, you know that the patients who respond to EGF receptor tyrosine kinase inhibitors only are those that have mutations of the epidermal growth factor receptor. And you know, in, in Southeast Asia, those types of lung cancer are very common. But this is what we found. When we sequenced this patient's tumor, it, the patient did not have this mutation. And that suggested to us that we were broadening the activity of this uh, agent well beyond what we'd normally see with EGF receptor tyrosine kinase inhibitors. So based on this result, we also conducted a window of opportunity trial. And now we found something equally interesting. One of the most resistant types of lung cancer are lung cancers that have KRAS mutations. <coughs> but what we found was that um, even patients with, with the absence of EGFR mutations 
but with KRAS mutations responded markedly to this new regimen. Thank you. And so what about the patient's tumors? So we did the same window of opportunity trial, and you can see the post-treatment biopsies here, and the pre-treatment biopsies here, and you don't need to be a pathologist. Do you see the dramatic decline in the post-treatment versus the pre-treatment? Once again, this only occurred when there were therapeutic intratumoral drug levels. So when we c completed these studies, we were not aware that there was another group at MD Anderson, I, I wasn't yet at MD Anderson, that was conducting the same clinical trials that we did. And this was the so-called battle trial. And you can see this is the regimen that my team had developed. And unbelievably, both groups had the same clinical results. That is, if you had a RAS mutation, you responded to therapy. And the patients who had the best responses had two criteria. One was hypertriglyceridemia, which is an example of uh, rexinoid response, or rash, which is an example of EGF receptor response. <clears throat> so this means that two independent groups both saw the same positive results, giving us confidence this is probably quite an active regimen. So that was a study done in the clinic, actually a series of studies, five clinical trials that my group reported, and a sixth one reported by MD Anderson while prior to my arrival. But could these same drugs that are administered orally that are extremely well tolerated, could they actually prevent lung cancers from forming in the first place? <coughs> and so we did another series of experiments, this time in the laboratory, with uh, my colleague Mike Sporn, who's the father of cancer prevention, a pioneer in the field. And we were studying strain AJ mice that, uh, in the absence of carcinogen, never get lung cancers. And when you add the carcinogen vinyl carbamate, they have both premalignant and malignant lesions. And the question we asked was, if you added the rexinoid along with the carcinogen, would you ab be able to prevent those lung cancers from forming? And if you did the same experiment with the EGF receptor tyrosine kinase inhibitor, what would happen? To our great surprise, we were able to nearly eradicate the lung cancers from ever forming in the mice. So this is the control mouse lung treated with the carcinogen. Here is the control mouse lung treated with the carcinogen plus the rexinoid. And here is a micro, a micro MRI scan of the mouse. And you can see even a, a dramatic reduction so what we have proposed is these agents can not only be used to treat cancers, but can be used to prevent cancers in the first place. I'm a physician scientist, and as a physician scientist, there's questions that I'm interested in in the laboratory and in the clinic. And one of the big questions we didn't answer was if we were to actually drive in the mouse lung abnormal expression of these cell cycle proteins, would we actually create a lung cancer from forming in the first place? So I'm going to show you one slide of a paper we published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences that showed uh, we could make trans transgenic mice that drove the expression of uh, cyclins into the mouse lung, and these mice spontaneously develop lung cancers. At the same time, we made cell lines from the mouse transgenic lung cancers. And because these are genetically identical, 
from the, the mouse strain from which they were derived, we were able to develop a new model for lung cancer. These lung cancers typically arose in mice in four months, but within two weeks, we could develop a transplantable lung cancer model. And so this transplantable model we've now used for assessing lung cancer prevention and treatment trials in mice before going into patients. So this was a result that we were quite excited about. <coughs> because it suggested that what we had discovered in the laboratory was relevant <coughs> to human lung cancer patients. And now I'm going to end my presentation with the latest work in our laboratory. So the cell cycle proteins exist as complexes with enzymes that are called kinases. They're called cyclin-dependent kinases. This drug is an inhibitor of the cyclin-dependent kinases. It's already been moved into the clinic. It's well tolerated. And uh, we already know there's evidence of activity in overt lung cancers. So what's interesting about this drug is that it's a fully reversible drug, but uh, we found a pathway that we think is incredibly relevant to lung cancer prevention and therapy. And I'll tell you about this pathway that we've, that we've discovered. The first thing that we found is that this drug that will actually target the cell cycle machinery um, can actually prevent lung cancers in mice. And this is uh, an example of that. And, and at the same time, we found that these kinase inhibitors, which were fully reversible, when given to lung cancer cells, to our great surprise, they irreversibly killed lung cancer cells. So how could a fully reversible drug become irreversible? And so over the course of several years, we found the answer to that question and we've discovered an entirely new pathway for treating and preventing lung cancers. And this pathway we've called anaphase catastrophe. And it's, an, it's a clinically relevant pathway because one of the features of human lung cancers and, can and cancers in general is that they are chromosomally unstable, they have extra chromosome copies, and this is a way to target that chromosomally abnormal cells because these uh, abnormally uh, reduplicated cell chromosomes have what's called extracentrosomes, and this pathway prevents these clustering of the centrosomes and leads to the death of these cells. This is what the cells look like oops, when, they, when they die. I'm going to show you a video that um, shows you what these cells look like when they are dying. So before you see these cells, I want you to look closely at the center cell. This cell goes through a very abnormal division. Do you see that? And now there are three daughter cells. Two are going to fall below the, the level of the microscopic field. And now we're seeing two of them. Here's one, here's the other. Do these cells live when they divide or do they die? First cell's dead, second cell's dead. So this is an entirely new way to treat cancer by taking a, a very fundamental feature of cancer cells that they're chromosomally unstable and selectively killing them. So I'm going to go back to uh, my presentation. And the reason that we're so excited about this work is that this pathway is relevant to not only lung cancers, but any cancer. It's a fundamental feature of cancer biology.
So to tell you once more, cancer cells have what's called supernumerary centrosomes. I just showed you a video of a dying cancer cell. These supernumerary centrosomes need to cluster for cells to divide. And the drugs that we're working on now prevent that clustering. And the cells die as they go through cell division. <coughs> this is what the cells look like just before they die. And that death is very intriguing because it only occurs in cancer cells and normal cells are spared. So um, we used a new technology called robotic screening where we screened upwards of 1,200 cancer cell lines and we discovered something else quite interesting. And that is uh, shown in this slide. We found here, if we screened, in this case, 270 cancer cells, that black bars show you dramatic reduction of growth, gray bars show you moderate growth inhibition, and the white bars are minimal. But the vast majority, as you can see, have major growth inhibition. Because this was a robotic screen, we could link it to what's called the Sanger Genetic Database. And we were able to show unexpectedly, that the most sensitive lung cancer cells harbored mutations of the RAS oncogene, whereas the most insensitive were wild type. So this was a puzzle that we had to solve because RAS mutations of lung cancer represent the most lethal type of lung cancer. And so how was it that we could cause the death of these cells? by using a kinase inhibitor and, and actually get responses in the very resist, most resistant form of lung cancer. Over the course of several years, we sought to resolve this puzzle. And let me state this puzzle to you in, in another way. There must be a factor that we called factor X that lung cancers had that made them particularly sensitive to CDK2 inhibitors that caused this anaphase catastrophe. And we've actually discovered the answer to that puzzle. And it turns out it is a centrosome protein called CP110. And now we've published a, a number of papers demonstrating that we've accounted for the resistance mechanism and the sensitive mechanism. When we overexpress the KRAS oncogene, we can drive down the expression of CP110, therefore causing critical clustering of their, um, of their DNA. And this uh, analysis was done. Uh, it's looking at overall survival of 551 human lung cancer cases at MD Anderson, and we found that the CP110 protein was markedly downregulated when the RAS oncogene was present. So now I'm going to end by telling you our latest story, which will be published in a few weeks in the Journal of the National Cancer Institute. And what we have uh, been looking at is a next generation inhibitor uh, for the cyclin dependent kinases, and it is dramatically more active than the drug that I just described. It works also in RAS mutant lung cancers and causes the same anaphase catastrophe to be triggered. We've treated mice with this new drug and you can see a dramatic reduction of uh, lung cancer growth, no inhibition of weight changes, and a reduction of circulating tumor cells and a reduction in tumorigenicity. And so here is a drug that has just entered the clinic. Uh, phase one studies are being done uh, now. And this drug uh, is extraordinarily well tolerated and probably represents a new way to treat and prevent lung cancer. So what have I told you today is that we've discovered through a convergence of basic and clinical science, we've discovered new ways to combat lung cancer, 
but they derive from work done in leukemia. This occurred by moving this work of destruction, induced destruction of cell cycle proteins from the laboratory into the clinic. And future clinical studies need to be determined to see if we can prevent lung cancers from forming uh, in the first place. So the purpose of my telling you this story is to end with probably the most important message. In this great university that you're all part of, with a brand new clinical research center and a brand new research center that's being built, this is the message I'd like to give you. Finding that the cell cycle is a lung cancer target came about by our models, by the clinical trials that we performed, and by the very nature of translational research. So this is a model of what we oftentimes speak about, of bench to bedside research. It's a very optimistic image. It's optimistic because it suggests that we actually know what direction we want to do our work in as we move from the bench to the bedside. And that's actually not a good image. Really, a better image is a disrupted line with a big gap in the middle. And that gap is filled by great universities like yours. It includes window of opportunity trials, predictive cell, and experimental and transgenic animal models, interdisciplinary teams of staff, students, fellows, <coughs> and of course faculty. The story that I told you today spanned more than 20 years. And it's work that was developed by my team over 20 years. And my role is largely to be a spokesperson for the team. And so I'd like to show you my team. So these are the people that I worked with originally when I was at Sloan Kettering, which is where this work began. Collaborators at Harvard in the pharmaceutical setting. At Dartmouth, my team at Dartmouth um, and co colleagues at Dartmouth and now continuing with new colleagues at MD Anderson. So uh, with uh, this last slide, I'd like you uh, all to know this was work not done by me, but by many, many people over many years. Thanks so much for your attention. Anyone have questions? So from the, uh, the, the data that you have, it seems that the pattern of the cyclin D1, the cyclin D and cyclin E is prevalent in the KRAS mutation, is that correct? Yep. Uh, for, so in the, probably in the GFR mutation, supposedly it, it should be go on to the uh, canonical pathway of the GFR, why yep. they don't have the cyclin D and cyclin E? Well, I, I think that's a question that no one knows the answer to. But what I've told you today is that whether you, in either case, this regimen that we've discovered would work. So you, you, you don't need to be KRAS mutant to respond. You could still respond even if you're not KRAS mutant. You don't need to be EGF receptor mutant to respond. And so this is a broader regimen than, um, than uh, one would, that previously existed. The confidence that we have is that this work has um, been validated in five clinical trials that my group produced, a six that was produced at MD Anderson. And my hope is that this might even become um, FDA approved in the United States. Um, I've had the um, privilege of being involved in the FDA approval of another drug, all trans retinoic acid for acute pulmonocytic leukemia. So perhaps this might be another example, but that's a great question. Any other questions that people might have? Yes. Hi. Um, does the CDKI inhibitor increase the radio sensitivity to the lung cancer cells? Decrease the radio sensitivity. Decrease. Decrease it the opposite result. Maybe I didn't say that clear enough. Yeah, so the, I, did, I went over that slide pretty quickly. 
Um, the, um, it's an incredibly active regimen, and we did two things. We measured um, the luciferase activity in the tumors that I probably didn't convey clearly enough, but we actually, actually measured circulating tumor cells, and there was a significant reduction in circulating tumor cells. So, you have another question? Well, I may, may not like uh, 100% related to your, your talk, but I'm just, it seems like many tumor model right now, they're doing the organoid. Do you think it's worth doing it in the lung and the user? Um, say that again? Uh, the organoid model, the 3D dimensional model compared yeah, to the Yeah, so, so um, I think that's an incredibly valuable uh, uh, tool uh, for uh, a number of reasons. One is that Monolayer cultures don't predict activity in the clinic. And sadly, uh, many in vivo tumor models don't. But or organoid cultures and three-dimensional cultures allow you to preserve stem cells. So uh, before we end, uh, any other questions? I was just going to make one comment. So before we end, I wanted to say that um, this is my second time visiting Thailand. I told you about the first time when I worked uh, in uh, the Kaoidong refugee camp in Aranya Pratet. So I've spent a day with your leadership right here. Um, they're incredibly passionate about your great university. And I've spent now a day visiting and seeing firsthand your wonderful university. And I know the pride that they feel and the, that you feel to be part of this great university. And uh, I've learned so much in my short time here. I want to say uh, thank you to my hosts and thank you all for spending time with me today. Thank you. Is there any other comments or questions? So if not, on behalf of the host here, Faculty of Medicine, Jula Logon University. Uh, we would like to thank you, uh, Professor Dimitrovsky, for your uh, nice and informative presentation. Thank you.